So I've made a running gag out of making fun of John Norman's series of gore, um, which is just awful. This misogynistic dreck. And I've been uh, continuously saying of gore just to make fun of the fact that he often uses that construction. Um, but uh, you know, people will see me making fun of it and they ask, well, what review are you referencing? What, what, what review? Where's the review? I can't find the review. Oh, yes. The review. The review of Gore. The Gorian Review. The review of John Norman's Gorian Saga. The Chronicles of Gore. The review for Gore. That review. Yeah, okay, so, so here it is. Okay, so let's take a look at the 1966 book Tarnsman of Gore. Unfortunately, not Transman of Gore. The entry to the series and the literary equivalent of The Room. You are tearing me apart, Elena! Tarnsman of Gore is awful. Just yeah, insufferable, as books go. Like, I could barely get through this thing. It's got some of the worst writing I've ever seen. Like, you could compare it to My Immortal, except My Immortal is actually kind of interesting. It, it falls with style. This one just falls in a flaming wreck. Ah, dear God, this book. Tarnsman of Gore is just obnoxious. It's like trying to eat a dry turkey. It's just like, come on. So, so this is the sauce I'll dump on the dry turkey. The drinking game of Gore based on the drinking game of Lovecraft. Take a shot every time the construction of gore is used in the book. I suggest you don't actually use alcohol for this because you might die, but you know, substitute whatever you'd like. Chocolate, spanking your partner. It is a BDSM book. Um, and I'll be sipping this beer because dear God, because of gore is in the title, you can take a shot now and hit like, subscribe if you haven't already, leave a comment, hit the bell, your mistress commands. Okay, so it starts with the protagonist, Tarl Cabot. At least I think that's how it's pronounced. He, he's English, so Cabot, right? Clichedly stating his appearance as this tall, red-headed, pale guy from Bristol, which I'm guessing is what John Norman looked like in 1966. It kind of reads like one of these, um, like, like a girl's book with, um, now I'm describing my appearance because this is interesting. Um, you know, Divergent had it too. Wasn't impressed then either. So Tarl Cabot sharing how educated he is, like just so egotistical. He's like so educated, you guys. And uh, he goes to Oxford and he's this fencing expert, convenient. And he travels to America and becomes a visiting professor because he's just so smart. And, you know, this could be written as a character flaw for, like, an egotistical personality, Lydia Tarr, if you will, but, um, nope, it's just an insufferable protagonist that's probably a self-insert of the author. So there he goes to America, probably for no other reason than Edgar Rice Burroughs' A Princess of Mars is set in America. And this is a very close knockoff of such. Princess of Mars had a, uh, a former Confederate soldier as the protagonist, because uh, this book is racist as hell. Um, Tarnsman of Gore 
isn't quite racist, but that's like the closest thing to a compliment you could actually give the book. It's not quite racist. So the Confederate soldier kind of makes sense it would be said in America. But um, Tarnsman of Gore is just a knockoff, so they go to America for no real reason. So he becomes this fencing expert, which is very convenient, and uh, he decides to go camping one day. Okay, and while he's out in the woods, he gets a letter from his deadbeat dad who abandoned him and his mother when he was a little kid. He gets a letter kind of just straight out of the blue, arrives in his hands. It's metal and glowing blue because it's from space. He opens the letter, okay, and he's looking at it and it's like um, from his father who has kind of forgotten how to speak English well because he hasn't spoken it in years, which is kind of the most interesting world building aspect of this book, which is interesting because Oh, John Norman loves him some uh, world building. The book is filled with info dumps. The most interesting part is the letter being written in an odd way. Uh, basically, what it says is, I have been taken into space, and now you must also be taken into space. I've left an enclosed ring. Uh, keep this ring on your person. Bring me a handful of earth soil as a souvenir, and I'll see you in gore. This message will self-destruct. Yeah, yeah, so the, the letter is like, it's set up to self-destruct. And this came out the same year as the Mission Impossible series, with its... The state will self-destruct in five seconds. seems pretty clear that John Norman was just kind of watching TV and was like, oh, that's cool, I'll put that into my book. So, okay, he reads the letter, uh, it's glowing blue, so he knows it's uh, supernatural or whatever, and um, uh, he, he kind of is like, oh, I'm not sure what's going on, here's this ring, it's, it's made of this weird red metal, and he sticks in his pocket, starts to walk away from the camp, and then the letter explodes, in um, blue fire, like um, a plasma grenade from Halo. This terrifies him, and he starts running through the woods like Snow White and just totally freaked out by everything he sees, including trees, deer, owls, because he's just so freaked out. And uh, then he... Um, manages to get control of himself in time for an alien spaceship to land in front of him. And uh, at this point, alien spaceship, he's suddenly not freaked out. For reasons. So he does what the letter says, he has the ring he has on his person, he uh, takes up a handful of Earth's soil as a souvenir, and then he climbs onto the ship and promptly blacks out. So he wakes up on Gore in a medieval castle kind of environment with a tapestry that has like men hunting a griffin or something like that and or like a giant boar because uh, this is a fantasy world with giant boars and stuff. He takes a look outside the window and realizes he's in this weird alien city that's like um, kind of looks like bedrock from the Flintstones with a circular cylinder towers everywhere. Is this a penis metaphor? A door slides open, like a door in Star Trek, which also came out the same year. And then uh, Tarl Cabot's father, Matthew, comes in and he's this big brawny Viking type. They have this father-son heart-to-heart that's actually not that emotional because he's a very stoic man. Uh, Tarl tells him that his mother, Matthew's wife, died when Tarl was young, and this causes Matthew to feel genuine emotion, and he cries. And John Norman comments that 
on gore. There's no um, gender role problem with men showing genuine sadness, which is like bizarrely progressive. Like, like is this like an actual feminist point in this misogynistic dreck? Holy crap! John Norman, misogynist extraordinaire, actually put in a feminist point. I, I mean, it's not Steven Universe, but, but it's something. And it makes, it makes a good point. Uh, men should be allowed to have, like, the full range of emotion. Will this last? Outlook. Not so good. Okay, so Matthew, he's crying. Yeah, but he's also just very stoic and very brawny man, standoffish man figure. So he, uh, even this one little feminist point actually isn't that good because, uh, you know, there's still this uh, problematic, stoic, toxic masculinity being played out all over the place. Then the slavery happens. Matthew brings in a slave, Sana, uh, a slave girl, brings in uh, lunch for uh, Tarl and Matthew to eat, and she's this sexy slave girl, and Tarl doesn't recognize that she's a slave, but is kind of just uh, like, oh, she's hot. He notes that she's wearing a collar, but he doesn't realize that Sana's a slave. So why would he think that that's a collar? This, this book really gives off first draft vibes. Like, he could have described it as like a really weird tight necklace, not getting that it's a collar until he finds out that she's a slave later. And Sana is just like super submissive, but Tarl doesn't actually realize that it's a problem because this book came out in the 60s and that was just what gender roles for women kind of looked like. I actually wonder how a modern man would react to this scenario in gore. Like, what about Ravi from iZombie? Uh, put him in Tarl's place, he's reconvening with his father, and then um, there's this slave girl, and it's like, oh, her behavior's so weird. Like, oh, uh, women are, aren't really supposed to act like that. Like, like that would, like, freak him out. And um, not sure what to think. Like, that's a much more interesting story. Why couldn't we have that? <laughs> It's also of note that she's blonde-haired and blue-eyed, and um, so as bad as the whole slavery thing is, at least it isn't racist. At least it isn't as bad as Princess of Mars, at least in that way. It's not a glorification of American slavery, just a weird fantasy slavery. Best compliment I can offer this book. <laughs> We're then treated to info dumps of John Norman's world building because he couldn't think of like integrating his ideas into the setting properly. He had, had to have like these long info dumps of, uh, and this is uh, how the world works. And we get our first of gore. Okay, so the important part of the info dumps is that. Each Gorian city-state has a big rock called a gore that's like their flag. And when the city-states go to war with each other, they play capture the flag, or they each try to steal each other's gore, take it back home, humiliate the other city. It's a big rock. I can't wait to tell my friends. They don't have a rock this big. And anyway, the planet's basically named Flag. So the humans of gore are ruled by aliens called the Priest Kings, keeping everyone at Conan the Barbarian levels of technology, except in certain cases, like the cities have the Star Trek doors and light bulbs for reasons. Okay, so here's the thing with Gore. It's a planet on the other side of the sun, sharing Earth's orbit, being its counterpart, a counter-Earth. There's always the sun in between, so you can't see the other planet. The people from Earth can't see Gore, people of Gore can't see Earth. But every so often, the priest kings grab people from Earth, take them to Gore to populate it. 
Uh, Gore isn't originally from the solar system. It's from a far-off star system that the priest kings grabbed, experimented on, stuck it in our solar system. To be a counter-Earth, which is a conspiracy theory that people actually believe. It's like the thing where people think that the world is hollow and there are lizard people underneath the surface that may or may not be a replacement for the ruling class of society that may or may not be a um, euphemism for the Jews. It's a really dumb conspiracy theory that people actually believe. And John Norman, I swear, believes this. Like, the book just kind of interrupts so that Matthew can share reasoning for why a counter-Earth makes sense. John Norman just completely forgets about the idea that Matthew can barely speak English anymore to have him <laughs> talk about how, uh, like, irregularities in the radio spectrum actually have good evidence for the fact that there's this counter-Earth. One of the um, criticisms of the counter-Earth theor theory is that uh, if there is a counter-Earth out there, it would have a gravitational impact on the surroundings. So even if the astronomers on Earth couldn't see it, they could at least speculate that there's an object there because they'd see the effects on the surrounding uh, celestial objects. Matthew just says the priest kings use their alien technology to make sure that never gets picked up by astronomers. How convenient. <laughs> Due to stuff later, I think the counter-earth thing might be associated with some of these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about the lizards and such. Um, just because stuff happens later, that makes me think that John Norman might be anti-Semitic. And also the priest kings kind of have that um, international Jewry thing. That's just my impression. So like Matthew, the priest kings brought Tarl to Gore for a specific purpose. It's later indicated that he's like a special hero, but um, at this point, John Norman didn't think of that. So it's just the priest kings grab people sometimes and they take them to Gore. And isn't Tarl lucky? So Matthew takes him to a teacher to teach him about Gore, its culture, and its language. And this guy is Merlin from the Sword in the Stone. They don't say Merlin. They don't say anything specifically about the Sword in the Stone. But the description, it's Merlin from the Sword in the Stone, the Disney film that came out three years before the book was published. Uh, He's a skinny, blue-robed scholar. He has the demeanor of an angry bird um, that, that gets mad at squirrels. He teaches Tarl the Gorian alphabet, and it's Merlin from The Sword in the Stone, the Disney movie, in this slavery fantasy weirdness. It's like if a comic skater came out with this super edgy, slavery fetish, anti-feminist comic, and then stuck in a character that was clearly Bruno from Encanto, because the author liked Encanto. Also, the father character in The Sword in the Stone is voiced by a man named Sebastian Cabot. Like how the father character and Tarnsman of Gore is Matthew Cabot. Coincidence? I think not! Aside from learning from scrolls, there is a special alien Gorian technology that helps um, Tarl learn the Gorian language. A special translator that is a marvel of miniaturization for being only the size of a portable typewriter. Yeah, John Norman isn't exactly Arthur C. Clarke, as predictions go. So Not Merlin, called Torm, teaches Tarl of Gore. And Tarl muses on the ethics of Gore.
Another excuse for info dumps. Just constant info dumps. It's like, shut up! Some of it is relevant to the plot, but I'll get to that later, which is where it should have been in the plot. He's talking about uh, geography and world building crap of gore. Yeah. So the Gorian Society is a caste system. And Torm, the Merlin guy, is of the scholar cast of Gore. So Tarl finally acknowledges that slavery exists and he addresses it. He is horrified by it. Kind of. A little. Maybe? So there's this slave cast, and Tarl thinks this is a bad thing and wants to abolish it. And he tells his father this. And his father just kind of shrugs. Like, I don't think that you're going to believe that for too long. And he's right. Because in order to fulfill the slavery fetish, the uh, protagonist has to change his mind. It's this manly fantasy about becoming a man. But becoming a man becomes about conformity, which isn't that manly. It's ultimately about uh, cowardice. He can't really be his own man. He has to become his father's idea of what a man is. You know, uh, Gravity Falls had an episode about uh, Dipper dealing with the idea that he was feeling insecure, uh, not a real man, and he goes on this uh, quest to become a real man in the eyes of these toxic masculine jocks. And uh, by the end, he's forced to um, fulfill what the jocks expect of him and kill an innocent being who likes Abba like he does. Uh, and he decides to stick up for the innocent being and embrace his love of Abba. And in that act, he is a real man. He's manly. He stands up for himself. That half-hour episode for kids is way better than this whole whole book that's like uh, it, I don't know if it's like 200 pages but or less than 200 pages but feels like it goes on forever it's about being a man but it's ultimately about conformity okay so he learns the scholarly stuff from the scholar but then he's trained as a warrior by a viking type actually described as like a viking and this guy has the dumbest name <laughs> like just imagine what is the dumbest name like the worst conceivable name this kind of character could have adolf stick oh i know tarl the same name as the protagonist i imagine john norman just couldn't think of a name and was like uh I like Tarl. Yeah, okay. This guy, he's now older Tarl, and the protagonist is the younger Tarl. That's how we will differentiate them. Older Tarl, the official canonical name, the way to distinguish these characters, is a very simple man on this world of gore. The culture of gore is really kind of fascist. It's this uh, Viking-esque world with uh, 300 uh, um, aesthetics and uh, kind of the eugenics thing. Like it, It's emphasized that the priest kings pit the humans of gore against each other to select for the strongest breeds. They don't have shields or armor. They just have weapons so that um, people who aren't strong will die quickly and the breeding pool will uh, be selective for the strongest strongest people militaristic eugenicist um so these guys are fashy older tarl is very explicitly described as a viking and matthew is at least body type wise like a viking and he he's stoic like a viking and it's very evocative of uh, white supremacist um, Norse neo-paganism. Whether or not this is intentional, it's kind of hard to say. 
he's at least playing in the same playground, the sa same sandbox as um, white supremacists. It's a fantasy based on a white supremacist idea of the world, very similar to 300. This is God! Yeah! For what it's worth, John Norman says that he was heavily inspired by the works of Nietzsche. War chieftains of the city-states of Gore are called Ubars, which is very slightly removed from Uber or Ubermensch, a person who defies the uh, ethics of that the world would impose upon him and defines ethics for himself, which isn't anything like Gore, I don't know. Or is Tara like the last man? Someone familiar with Nietzsche, comment please. Okay, so younger Tarl was a fencing expert, so he masters the sword pretty quickly, and then he becomes a Tarnsman, which means that he learns how to tame Tarns, which are essentially rocks, the giant bird from Indian mythology, the, like, like, like a giant eagle that can pick up and eat an elephant. There are giant birds of gore, and they can fly because the uh, gravity is slightly lesser on gore than on Earth, though this never actually seems to impact the world. Like, they don't um, make death defying leaps, and like, Tarl doesn't have to relearn um, physics. Like, it, it's really just an excuse for the birds to fly. And then what follows is basically the scene in Avatar where Jake Sully has to uh, tame that bird, the, like the giant alien bird, to prove his manliness. I could see Tarn's Men of Gore actually inspiring Avatar. It, like it seems like it could have played a role, unless this is a ripoff of something else that Avatar could also be ripping off. Possible. So younger Tarl tames a tarn with a tarn goad, a stick that, uh, uh, that shocks them. It's very brutal and like this would not fly today with like uh, the animal rights people and the uh, just the care we have for animals now. It's just brutal in the way he dominates this bird. This is kind of similar to uh, bit in Princess of Mars where the confederate soldier tames and masters a dog, alien dog, then deems it his slave because he's a confederate and ugh. even there it, it seems like much more civilized if you will, um, whereas uh, Tarnsman of Gore it's brutal like he's the big strong guy and he masters the big fierce the bird thing and um, beats into submission but he doesn't tame it because a true master of a tarn would be um, constantly wary of a tarn's attacks because that is uh, manly 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 anyway he flies really really high on the tarn and older tarl admonishes him for flying so high, like, what is he trying to do? Reach the moons of Gore. After some obnoxious world building info dumps, we finally get moving here with the action here. Um, a guy named Pakor tries to kill Tarl, an assassin. Um, um, every time this guy gets named, I, I think of Parkour. But uh, obviously, uh, parkour came about in like the 90s, so that's not really um, John Norman's fault. It's just an example of the book not aging well. So uh, there's this guy who tries to assassinate the main character, and then he gets away. And um, Charles like, what just happened? <laughs> Older Charles like, no, we'll discuss that later. For now, we party. <laughs> And, like, and younger Charles just goes along with this. Yes, now we party. This is what we do here. Um, like, I'd be like, that guy just tried to kill me. We can party later. <laughs> like, what the heck? No? No? Stop? 
and tell me what's going on here. Instead, we go pub hopping. And um, while they're pub hopping, getting drunk like Vikings, um, not talking about the assassination attempt, they observe the pleasure slaves, four of them, and they put on this sexy dance, and uh, Tarl is off put by the fact that they're slaves, and he's like, oh no, that's not a good thing. And uh, older Tarl's like, ah, come on, kid, grow up. Younger Tarl's like, no, that's, that's horrible. <sighs> And then he's kind of empathizing with the slaves and uh, thinking about like what they're doing in such a way that's both like illustrative of his empathy and kind of an illustration of the fetish because it's talking about exactly what the slave women are doing. Holder Tarl is saying like the these women are born to be slaves. Like look at them, just look at them. And um, younger Charles like. Oh, well, eh, you have a point. I mean, slavery, that's horrible, but... Oh yeah, I missed enough gore back there. So Pakur is working for a villain named Marlenus, who is kind of a Hitler figure, I think? Um, who is trying to become Ubar of all gore. Okay, that one can slide. Younger Tarl. He thinks about how hot one of the slaves is, and then thinks about owning her. And then he's like, oh no, but that, uh, that's a bad thing. I shouldn't be thinking about that. But very, very eh about it. <laughs> like, uh, oh, I should be horrified by having that thought. But he's not. Imagine if this were Ravi. Like, um, imagine how, like, a, a really good man would interpret this thing like like he'd be horrified he'd want to help them but also be maybe turned on by it and be conflicted and be like okay maybe I'll do my best to end slavery but uh, maybe I have to make a few compromises uh, that could actually be an interesting story why can't we have that because this came out in the mid 60s <laughs> I mean, things for women weren't in great shape, but slavery is bad was hardly a revolutionary concept at the time. Okay, so Tarl graduates from his training and learns that his father, this man who he's been estranged from for so many years, is actually the former Ubar of the city-state they're now in called Koroba. And this should be evoking some complicated feelings in him, like, oh, it, should he be feeling pride for this man? What does that mean for him? Matthew, he, he's like uh, giving him the honor of becoming a Gorian adult, and should he be feeling pride? Uh, uh, is, is this the kind of society he really wants to be a part of? Does he want to take over it to be uh, better. Uh, he really should be conflicted and have these strong emotions, but there is nothing. John Norman is an awful writer, so there's just no emotional depth to this. It's just he goes through the motions of becoming a Gorian adult, and now he's going to be in the warrior cast, and he's just going to be part of Gorian society because... Ugh. Okay, so his first mission as a warrior is to play Capture the Flag with the city-state of R, which is also called the Empire of R, and uh, he's going to capture the gore, and he's going to take it back to Karoba to humiliate the Ubar of R, who is Marlenis, the guy who had parkour sent to uh, kill younger Tarl. So the plan is like this. He's gonna take Sana the slave girl along with some supplies in the tarn that he tarn tamed and he's gonna take the tarn to R and while they're in the middle of a big R party he's going to take uh, have Sana take the place of Marlenis's daughter 
like, like a priestess doing the ceremony with the gore. He's basically just gonna sacrifice Sana. So while um, the the R people <laughs> are distracted with Sana and gonna kill her, he's just gonna take the Argor. Now it's pronounced Igor. And take it back to Karoba to embarrass Marlenas. Though he has like an emotional reaction to having a slave girl that he's going to sacrifice later, at first he's just, pfft, there's nothing there. He's just a dumb jock, basically. Like he's just gonna take the slave girl on this mission and he's just gonna be a warrior. There's his whole plan with the people of R. And let's talk about that for a sec. So it's called R as in AR, evoking Gore, G-O-R. Now the people of Gore are called Gorians. Logically, the people of R would be Aryans. R is led by this guy, Marlenis, who wants to be Ubar of all Gore. So I think he's a Hitler figure, but only in a very simplistic sense of wanting to take over the world. He's an imperial figure. We then get four instances of, of gore in rapid succession. So he finally starts feeling sorry for Sana the slave girl, but not because he's ardently opposed to slavery, but because she was a free woman who was captured and imprisoned and subjected to a life of slavery. He's now internalized the idea that there are natural slaves, and <laughs> he thinks it's a crime that a free person should become a slave. So now he feels sorry for her, and he decides to subvert the mission that uh, the uh, Koroba and Korobans have um, laid out for him. He uh, takes his turn on a detour to the city-state where Sana came from and um, leaves her on a tower. At this point, you can imagine that her emotions are running wild because she was a slave and now she's freed and uh, she starts crying and um, Tarl is completely unsympathetic. It's just this misogynistic creep who describes it as like a feminine absurdity. Like, uh, let me look at the phrasing here. Uh, the incomprehensible absurdity of the female kind. And Tarl, like, looks at her and then tries to evaluate how much she would be worth on the market as a slave. So he flies to Gore and sneaks around a bit before some Aryan patrols find him and there's a mid-air Tarn battle that Tarl can win because unlike the people of Gore, he has um, brains and brawn and can trick them in a um, weird move that they don't expect. And he gets to R and he starts sneaking around and then some Gorian jerks start to, um, trying to pick a fight with him, so he, he has to be intimidating to the the brutish jock men, and um, so we're treated to some info dumping about um, Gorian customs and how um, he has to <laughs> trade insults with them till they uh, like acknowledge how he's a strong man because if they see weakness they'll try to kill him, and uh, these are the ways of Gore. <clears throat> so he goes to get the gore of R, but he messes up the timing and gets attacked by guards. And Marlenis's daughter, Talena, uh, like grabs onto the tarn to try to like, like keep him from escaping, but she just ends up getting pulled up into the air with the tarn as, as they're escaping. So he's got the gore, he's uh, flying over the forest, and Talena is like a damsel in distress as far as Tarl can tell and he suddenly gets all chivalrous and decides he's gonna help her but Talena is, is like 
you're an enemy, come on, and um, pushes him off of the tarn. Um, but because she's, you know, a woman who can't operate um, a tarn or whatever, um, eventually she crashes the, the tar tarn. Tarl, like, falls into a forest swamp where he runs into a giant spider. The giant spider is friendly. He doesn't attack... Um, Rational beings is how they phrase it. Okay, so the Aryans are oppressing the giant spiders, the spider people. So uh, when the spider sees that Tarl is, uh, uh, you know, uh, he's subverting the Aryans, he's going to uh, cause them some trouble. Uh, the spider's like, oh, I'll help you. You're a friend. Tarl befriends the giant spider. And they're going along on this webby terrain and um, just the best of friends, man and spider. I love a and um, Tarl calls him an insect like four or five times. And then um, Talena, when she ends up joining the group, she calls him an insect too. John Norman seriously thought spiders were insects. Insect. It, it has sect in it. Six legs. Uh, spiders, they have eight legs. They're arachnids. So when, like, John Norman is interviewed about this stuff, he deflects criticism by saying that it's a thinking man series. You really have to be quite smart to appreciate the series of gore. And if you're not that kind of thinking man, um, you're just not gonna get it. You have to be smart enough to know that spiders are insects. And I know what you're going to say. Well, these are wacky alien spiders. Uh, maybe they have six legs. <laughs> no, no. The, the book specifies they have um, they have eight legs like normal spiders. They're just big spiders that um, John Norman thinks are insects because he's a thinking man. So they run into Talena, who's gonna be eaten by a giant lizard and Tarl rescues her because he's a manly man and this is what heroes do. She tries to run away but the spider captures her and he's like got his big pincher fangs over her neck and he's threatening to chomp down um, but Tarl knows this is a bluff because spiders do not kill rational beings. So he uh, very coldly says, do it, whatever, <laughs> to uh, terrify her and, you know, tame her because she's obstinate and just a little annoying at this point. <laughs> he just trusts that the spider won't kill her. But he doesn't know that. All he knows is rational being. He doesn't know how spiders see women. I mean... In this society, the Gorian society, they have, like, um, you know, women are slaves, so would a spider think that they're rational? You don't know nearly enough to be able to do this kind of bluff with confidence. So Tarl and the spider condescend to her because they're both men, or males at least, and um, then there's this weird info dump about the outfit that she's wearing that... I think is based on the, uh, how do you say, niqab, and it's this weird exotifying thing, uh, so add Islamophobia to the list of sins, by the way, two of gores. So according to Tarl, that outfit is necessary to protect her from rape. In the real world, this kind of thing is um, often justified with that, that kind of excuse, because of the idea that uh, if lustful men see a woman's body, they won't be able to control themselves and thus blame their um, inability to control themselves on the woman and not them being um, monstrous. But because of the way Gore works as the slavery fetish world, um, it's, it's like backwards, where uh, if a man sees a woman's body, he'll be able to know if she is worth a lot on the slave market. <laughs> and if he can't see the form, then he might be taking a big risk and then stealing a woman who is, 
ugly and then be unable to get a big price for her because this book is creepily obsessed with how much women are worth in slave markets. So Taro frees Talena as an act of cruelty, condemning her to the swamp and its ravages, um, and basically making her beg him to help her get out of the swamp, forcing her into you know, doing a symbol of submission, the protocol of a slave, this thing where she bends the knee and crosses her wrists to uh, have have them be uh, bound. Yeah, so Tarl's a jerk. And we get two more of Gores, because of course we do. Okay, so Gorian Protocol says that he has to either accept a woman's submission and become her slave owner or kill her. So even though Taro nominally is anti-slavery still, he's forced by manners to become a slave owner. Okay, whatever helps you sleep at night. So Taro and Talena ride the giant spider out of the swamp, sort of, until they get too close to R, at which point the spider has to leave them, so they go out on their own. But for a while, it's like the book predicted spider riders. When the wicked rise, the word goes out, calling all spider riders. So then they're on their own, and then they run into quicksand, because of course they do. That's just what adventurers do in swamps. And to get out, uh, Talena has to take off her veil, basically doing a minor striptease so that the veil could be used to pull her out. John Norman promptly forgets that he did this and has her later take off the veil for the first time later. <laughs> Talena doesn't like being a slave. Not because slavery is some inhuman evil that uh, degrades it, it's just like absolutely irrehensible, but because She's used to being the daughter of an Ubar, so she's this arrogant, entitled little princess, as the book frames it. And so she, she fights him, so Tarl has to beat her into submission, and then to make his point, has her do a striptease, in which she takes off her veil for the first time, and he sees her face, despite her previously taking off her veil for the first time in the quicksand scene. And uh, yeah, so so she is uh, forcibly stripped. Hot? And he, he does this exchange where, where he's like, I won't even rape you because like that would be a compliment. So by denying it, I'm going to insult you. And it's done in this really, really hammy way, which is kind of amusing, but at the same time, oh my god, this book is sexist. Also, the whole taming thing has to be done according to the codes of gore. Tarl feels a little guilty because he thinks that the spider guy would judge him, even though the spider guy was fine with him doing it when, when he was like, um, he had, he had the pinchers around the girl's neck. So it's like, uh, did you proof this at all? <sighs> so the Aryans show up and take, take Tarl prisoner and, uh, Talena starts to be like, ha ha ha, I have got control now. And he, she spits in Tarl's face and then the Aryan guys are like, cool, now you're our slave. And uh, so both of them are now the prisoners. Um, we find out that since Tarl stole the gore, R is in chaos, Marlin has lost his power, there's now uh, different factions fighting for control. Because Tarl stole the gore, that makes him a threat to the faction that these guys represent. 
So uh, they plan to kill both Tarl and the girl because as the daughter of Marlenis, she represents his faction. Talena and Tarl work together to apprehend the uh, bad guys, to take control, and um, at this point you would expect them to be like, okay, we have to work together. So now we're equals. Except, no, he has to dominate her again, because of course he does. Forget it, Jake. It's gore. So he allows her to wear clothes, but he makes her wear her undergarments, because of course he does. He's strange enough, foreign enough, that Talena basically recognizes that he might not be around from around here, so she asks if he's of gore. He doesn't admit to being from Earth, but talks about his family, and they talk about families, and they chit-chat a bit, and Tarl recognizes that his father isn't quite of gore himself, that he uh, hasn't adjusted to the rude customs of gore. During their chit-chatting, she shares that she mistreated her slaves. Which Tarl feels, like, insulted by. Like, this is a huge violation of ethics. Not that she owns slaves, but that she mistreats them. He's pissed at her now. She begs him to let her come with him, because without him, she would be raped on the cruel plains of gore. So Tarl's pissed at her, so he makes her do degrading slave things, which turns out to be just what she wants, so she still wins, which the book treats as like a funny irony, but uh, it's like sexist in its framing that she would even want this, like, what? And so they, you know, travel around and they chit chat and they're described as, traveling underneath the moons of gore. So they sort of become friends, and uh, then Tarl starts to worry that the people of Koropa might want to kill her. So he hopes that she can just live as his slave, because of course! In case more Aryans show up, she devises a cover story about being the daughter of a rich merchant. Of gore. I'd say, that's neat! She's smart! That adds balance! I mean, I would say that, except it doesn't actually work that well, so yeah. There's a merchant caravan that, um, uh, they run into, Tarl ends up offending this warrior guy named Kazrak, and um, they have to have a fight because that's how men relate in gore. Tarl stabs him, after which point they uh, become friends, because okay. So the main merchant guy of the caravan, Mintar, whose name is totally just Minotar with a few letters removed, um, is like, you hurt the guy who was defending me. Uh, what are you going to do? Uh, like, are, are you going to pay me? Uh, um, okay, uh, here's this, this slave. Maybe uh, that would be payment. And uh, Talena busts out the, uh, I'm the daughter of the richest merchant in <laughs> Gore. And, and Tar's like, no, I'm the richest <laughs> merchant in Gore. So yeah, that worked well. Then they argue about how much she's worth. Because... Yeah. So Tarl actually sees himself as the hero and is like, okay, maybe I'll sell myself into slavery. Um, but, you know, he, he can't make a heroic sacrifice and be uh, worse off than any woman. So, you know, of course he gets hired in place of Kazrak. They just travel around with the, with Mintar's caravan for a while. And, um, because Talena is posing as a slave, she is added to the group of slaves of the caravan. 
she is um, not happy with that arrangement, but she gets used to it because, okay, the emotions of these characters are not gone into at all. Like, there is no character to these characters. Uh, it's really just, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then they did this. This character demonstrated she was arrogant, but... <laughs> also, we get two more, of course. Tarl puts her in a collar that says, Proper Property of Tarl of Bristol. This would be a perfect time for her to have, like, a reaction. Go into her character, go into Tarl's character, how they really relate to each other, what their emotions are, but they're completely flat. Norman has no interest in going into the characters, even when it would be in service of the fetish to elaborate on what they're feeling, which isn't good erotica. You need to t talk about what the characters are going through. Even on the level of erotica, this is bad. And then there's another of gore. Of course there is. Talena dresses in slave attire, and then Tarl effectively having tamed her, Talena falls in love with him, because of course she does, and then she just acts like a happy pet, because of course she does. That's how women work, right? The caravan runs into a large group of marauders, and we get this extended dialogue on how uh, marauders are bad, and then they're just like a traveling circus, uh, a fairground that just set up shop in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and we get three of course in close succession. Of course we do. So Tarl and Talena stroll around the fairgrounds because that's apparently what the Marauder Camp is. And they chit chat, talk about slavery and crap. There's actually a slave auction going on and Talena is like, oh, honey, look at the pretty slaves. Isn't that one pretty? How romantic. And the slaves in the auction act happy. Instead of just assuming, like, they've been ordered to act happy, Tarl takes this completely at face value and assumes they are happy, happy being slaves, and thinks that, um, Women of Earth are also basically slaves, and they're happy in their submissive subordinate role. But unlike the women of Gore, they're not um, properly respectful of the men they solicit to own them and take care of them as husbands, which is probably a commentary on feminism, which is actually good evidence that women of Earth are not happy being slaves. John Norman speaking through Tarl is just like, they are slaves, they're just ungrateful slaves. My god, John Norman, you repulsive misogynist, that god. We also get enough gore and all of that. Ugh. The organized caravan falls apart as a new threat emerges. But no time for that. We have a gratuitous belly dancing scene. And then Pakur shows up and uh, we get another of Gore because of course we do. Pakur captures Tarl, takes him prisoner and tells him that Tolena sold him out as basically as Judas is now going to be Pakur's bride. You are tearing me apart, Talena! He then wants to humiliate Tarl, crucify him. They tie him to a wooden frame across and set him down the river to die as like a dishonorable way to die. Like, um, Jesus. Yeah, Tarl Cabot, slavery guy, is in fact a Christ figure. Very similar to the um, Thomas Covenant, the uh, rapist um, guy with leprosy from um, uh, the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, Lord Fowl's Bane. I mean, 
What can you even say about that? God damn these books. So Tarl suffers some Passion of the Christ, and then his old Tarn shows up and tries to eat him. Um, like, picks him up in on the cross, uh, takes him to the Tarn's nest, picks him loose of the cross while trying to eat him. Tarl kind of fights him off. Uh, Tarn's like, well, I guess I'm not going to eat you, so I'm just going to you know, keep you here for now and um, go do Tarn things. Tarl just kind of thinks about his situation, um, collects his gear, which is there because <laughs> it's his Tarn, isn't that convenient, and um, gets the gore of R so he can resume his mission, he can do all that. Uh, but, you know, it would have been really easy to make this be about friendship between him and the Tarn. There could have been this bond between man and beast, but it's emphasized that Tarns have no sympathy. They don't care about their Tarnsmen, just these monstrous animals that must be tamed. It would have worked well for the bond between man and beast to reconnect Tarl with the supplies and with the gore of R. why he gets free because he was kind to this animal and the animal repaid the kindness. But there's none of that. It's just a bunch of brutal, manly stuff. And um, as a result, it's just horrible writing. He just happens to get free because a tarn picks him up. And it just happens to be his old tarn. So he just happens to get his supplies and the gore of R. And, uh, like, come on. Oh, and I guess he symbolically rose into the heavens by being picked up by the tarn. You know, the rapist Christ figure. <laughs> he muses about the gore of R and the R of Gore. So he gathers his old supplies and shows how great a Tarnsman he is because he can tame a goat, tame a Tarn without a Tarn goad, which is a tool of animal abuse. Tame the Tarn as it feasts upon an antelope of Gore, of Gore. So, so he resumes his mission to return the Ar of Gore, um, or to t take it to um, Koroba. And then he immediately gets distracted by some hunters and then muses on what they could be hunting and then info dumps about the goats of Gore and the uh, leopards of Gore. And just info dumps about this crap about um, the goats of gore that are feasted upon by the uh, leopards of gore as they themselves try to feast upon the plains of gore underneath the moons of gore. That's just how this book reads. Really just one-handed writing, first draft, submitted, somehow got published, somehow spawned a huge series that's still going on. He then observes these Gorian leopards stalking a leper. After he gives leopards a specific alien name, he describes this alien name for Gorian cats, leopards, stalking a man that he sees in the Aryan wilderness that's like um, wearing the robes of someone who has this horrible infectious disease that uh, basically a cursed man um, uh, everyone must avoid. So he's a leper. He's a leper being stalked by leopards. I can just imagine John Norman being like and then there is a leper who's being stalked by leopards. I am a genius. This is a thinking man's book. So Tarl goes to help him, even though he's a leper. Saves him from the leopards. 
And then it turns out to be a trap, like the worst conceived trap ever, where the leper is Marlenis, and he was just like walking around in leper robes, being stalked by leopards, just in case some Tarnsmen came along and decided to help him, even though it's against the customs of Gore to help a leper. And then Marlenis could spring the, the trap. Okay, two more of Gore's. So Marlenis captures Tarl, subjects him to nine days of torture, and then gives a bad guy speech about how he's going to take over the world. At this point, I think he's basically indicated to be a Hitler figure. The R. Aryan thing comes into play. They, they never actually say Aryan. It's just kind of a logical uh, progression from Gorgorian, R. Aryan. They really emphasize how Marlenis is planning to be this dictator. He's going to take over all the different city-states of Gore and Tarl represents Koroba, and um, he does like um, the hero thing, oh, you'll never get away with this, and uh, says that um, what Tarl represents is justice from the Koroba, Koroban perspective, but like, what does he really bring to the table here? He's not significantly different from Koroba, as a culture. He rejects earth ethics. What exactly um, is Tarl's version of justice? How is it significantly different from Marlenis's? Karuba would have a different culture, but does it really matter that much? Like what color their flags are or whatever? Um, what shape their gore is? How they pronounce words? It, it doesn't actually matter that much if they get taken over by uh, an, an emperor a Fuhrer, if you will. If they stop being a bunch of warring city-states, that might actually be an improvement. Is it gonna hurt them in any way? They're just a bunch of slaving city-states that go to war with each other all the time. In a general sense, I'm against um, the, the hierarchy of um, a strong government, but um, in this case, it's like one strong government versus a bunch of smaller warring strong governments. What's the big deal? Even if Marlenis is a Hitler figure, he's just a guy who wants to take over the world. He's a dictator, but he's not like anti-Semitic. He's not genocidal. He enslaves people like everyone else. He, he's not like uniquely enslaving like uh, Hitler was to the Poles and Slavs. What exactly makes this guy a villain? He has a scary name? Imagine if a uh, the German Empire from World War I were to time travel and take over the Confederate States of America. Do we care? Are we caring about that? I guess I'm against empire on a very loose abstract level. Also against slavery, so... So Marlenis says that um, military might ensures justice which I think is supposed to be about um, might makes right and like totalitarianism. He says that military might ensures the establishment of government and from government laws can be established and justice can follow. Isn't that just how every government works? I, I guess um, Turl's an anarchist. Aside from being abstractly for anarchism, I'm not, like, super opposed to uh, a government ensuring justice, like, until you have an anarchist commune that can effectively do that, you have to kind of depend on, on government, so... Uh... It's so dumb. It's so dumb, it's brilliant. No! It's just dumb! So Tarl talks to Marlenis about his daughter and learns that Marlenis doesn't care about Talena because she betrayed him. Okay. This offends Tarl so much that he basically momentarily gets superpowers, hulks out, and just randomly starts killing people or, or throwing people around like he's uh, completely uncontrollable for a moment and then he runs out of steam and is Captured again, okay. No! He was my brother, 
And then got tired and slept. And this little display of defiance means that he's not just um, a dishonorable criminal, he's a proud warrior, and uh, so Marlinus will give him a warrior's death and has him be torn apart by Tarns because that's how you know, Gorians do things. Marlinus, like as a favor, shares with him that Talena didn't actually betray him to Pakur, that it was like a deal for um, Charles' life. She actually loves him. Okay. Random happenstance allows him to escape, and then he just goes on this mission to uh, rescue Talena. And then the next scene, he goes to Mintar to gather his allies and runs into Mintar and Marlinus, the guy he just escaped, playing Gorian chess. He just kind of observes them for a moment and then quietly interrupts their conversation. Marlinus just doesn't react to Turl at all. At first, I thought maybe um, he was in disguise and uh, pretending to be someone else. He says something earlier about um, wanting to keep a low profile, and he takes his ring off, um, tries not to uh, attract a lot of attention. So I thought, okay, he's, he's in disguise. But no, uh, he's just um, Marlenis's former prisoner who escaped him, and Marlenis just doesn't care. So now Tarl and Marlinus are basically friends, and they plot to take R away from Pakur together. So I think Marlinus is supposed to be a Hitler figure, and Tarl is now friends with him. Okay. They're fighting together on the same side to preserve R and the integrity of what we would presume to be the logical progression of our Aryans. I'm honestly unsure if John Norman is anti-Semitic or just like really stupid and not realizing he's stupid and then accidentally writing and then we're friends with Hitler. Not sure which is the best look. <laughs> Tarl and Marlinus argue about what to do with Talena with Marlinus wanting to kill her to preserve his honor. We get another of Gore because of course we do. So Marlinus now suggests that the priest kings brought Tarl to Gore to fulfill a specific purpose, to shake things up, which is actually an improvement on a Princess of Mars's thing where um, the protagonist, the Confederate soldier, is actually of a superior type of aliens that is pale and superior for being the pale race of aliens because that book is super racist. Yeah, Gore is an improvement on the racist thing that, that it's based on, even with the Hitler thing. So then there's this extended siege sequence where um, Marlinus lays siege to uh, the castle of R. There's another of Gore because they try to poison the uh, waterway using a specific type of poison found of Gore. Tarl discusses strategy with Kazrak and gives him a mission to go to um, Koroba and the city-state that Sana is from and raise an army, doing something that no one on Gore has done before. A, an alliance between city-states, which is interesting because you know, Marlinus is, uh, he, he's wanting to be Ubar of Algor. He's kind of doing the same thing, but in a very aggressive way, whereas Tarl's doing it in a uh, cooperative way. So I guess you could say that they're doppelgangers. I'm not entirely sure that John Norman was smart enough to intend that, but um, I'm surprised he's good enough to have a theme. And we get two more of gores, because of course we do. So there's like this constant running around back and forth, not really doing much. It feels like um, a Yaki Sack should be playing, but like he's 
like running around the city and he's like he goes to um visit Talena pretending to be a messenger from Pakur and um, then he realizes that it's not really Talena it's some body double after then he searches for Talena nearby in the city and it's just like constant running around back and forth filler if you will and there are two more of course so it turns out Pakur decided to have Talena killed to have a clean exchange of power. This causes Tarl to cry some manly tears before he realizes that this is unbefitting of a warrior of Gore. Meaning that the one thing that made this book somewhat progressive and its gender roles is now extinguished in favor of the toxic masculinity of Gore. So he takes his turn into the winds of Gore and goes to R to rescue Marlenis, who Pakor had captured earlier, and the book really didn't emphasize this even though it was kind of a big deal. Have fun storming the castle. Think it'll work? It would take a miracle. Bye-bye. So he walks around pretending to be an agent of Pakur, basically the kind of assassin role that Pakur had for Marlenis. So it's kind of an ironic thing. Uh, so he's walking around the castle and he decides to um, release all the Tarns to cause a big distraction, to rescue Marlenis, um, and something he can only do by showing off his manly might. And then he does this stunt to rescue Marlenis, a thing that really feels straight out of Conan the Barbarian. And then the two men embrace, so we're now just hugging it out with Hitler. In gratitude, Marlenis says that Tarl can do whatever he wants with Talena. So Marlenis goes off to overthrow Pakur while uh, Tarl goes to rescue Talena and then Pakur confronts him and um, Pakur keeps threatening to impale Talena, which seems like a big penis metaphor. So before they can do this big sword fight thing, um, a priest guy interrupts, like, like not a priest king, but like the head priest, the Pope of Gore, if you will interrupts to say that it's not Tarl's place so the priest kings will strike him down if he tries to do this heretical act and uh, Tarl basically says uh, I don't have any evidence that your priest kings um, are the kind of people I should care about if they even exist um, so uh, you know, I'm just gonna do my own thing which I guess is kind of the ubermensch you know, God is dead, and Ubermensch defies the ethics to define his own ethics. Head priest guy says, uh, well, the priest kings are going to strike you down for being a heretic. But then nothing happens. So um, then everyone starts freaking out. Maybe the priest kings aren't real at all. And uh, if that's the case, then uh, we can do whatever we want. One guy just decides to kill Talena. Uh, even though it goes against everything. Um, and the priest kings strike him down. He explodes in blue fire like a plasma grenade in Halo. Okay, the priest kings make it clear. Tarl's free to do what he wants. He does the uh, duel for Talena, and they have this you know big fight scene. Uh, he's gonna lose. Um, Oh uh, yes, yeah, so there's another of Gore. Huh. He's gonna lose, so um, just in the nick of time, Kazrak comes in um, with the reinforcements. It's enough of a distraction that Tarl is able to get the upper hand, but to save his uh, honor, pa Pakur kills himself. It's all very hammy, very cliched. Tarl and Talena declare their love for each other like they're on an equal playing field and not literally master and slave. Marlenis gives his blessing for their union. 
then he's promptly exiled from R for trying to take over the world. Kazrak is democratically elected to be the replacement for Marlinus in R. Now Kazrak and Sana are in love because of course, why, why not? Um, while uh, Tarl decides to free Talena for no clear reason, Kazrak will not apparently free Sana. So it's not even like a celebration of freedom at the end. It's just Tarl found that romantic for some reason. Yeah, and the book frames this as a happy wrap up to the threads of gore. There's a scene that's supposed to be romantic based on the idea of the knight riding off with the damsel into the sunset to live happily ever after. But it's like a twisted Gorian thing where he's a master with a slave and she's ritualistically struggling against him, even though it's made clear that she wants it. It's just a custom of gore. However, there's a sad ending where the priest kings send Tarl back to Earth on his wedding night after doing this big celebration where even the slave caste is temporarily freed and uh, everyone's happy and the slave caste lives in celebration like free men and then promptly gets re-enslaved. Sad ending, Tarl gets sent back to Earth. He wakes up like it was all a dream, but Rip Van Winkle style. It's been several months and he has the, uh, the, the ring. And presumably his muscles are significantly developed. Oh yeah, there's another of gore. So he very sadly returns to the workforce knowing that he was once this big hero who could tame a tarn and have slaves and crap. And he joins a fencing club, but it's not the same as the sword dueling of Gore. And um, after six years has learned that the Gorian uh, technology has halted his aging. And while it's made clear that it's like the medical technology that probably is the reason why he's not um, um, aging, he attributes it also to the priest kings still having a use for him. So he goes camping in the same area, hoping that one day they'll take him back to Gore. In the meantime, he decides to write a book and publish it as science fiction. So the book that you're reading now is literally him confessing to do all these horrible things <laughs> and just wandering around free on earth, not getting arrested for yeah, human trafficking, all this crap. And so concludes, finally, the first book of gore. There are 37 of them. One came out last year. So, this book is hot garbage. It is horribly written. Like, pacing, uh, plot, theme, character, it's just all crap. And, oh my god, the misogyny. Ah, It fails on every level. It fails on a literary level and an ethical level. It's just crap. Oh man, I've read some stinkers before. Necroscope, Lord Fowl's Bane, uh, My Immortal even, uh, i literal books written by Nazis, and uh, this book though, this book, oh my god, oh, it, it's just like John Norman, no morals, just this crappy, crappy book that, uh, like, written probably in a day, um, uh, Never looked back, somehow got published. I take the chicken raptors, the little leper rapist, ready player one. I take it all before I visit this book again. 
it is that bad. This book is weed killer for the soul. The one thing, the one thing that made this book good is the manly tears. And that is taken away. Like, I don't know, good isn't a great description. It's, it's moderately progressive. Now I'm sure people are wondering, how much of this is real? How much is it something that Norman thinks uh, makes sense about the world and how much is just an outrageous fantasy? I mean, there are some plausible erotic uh, fiction like the girl next door trope. Then there's a lot of stuff that's just really out there, outrageous. Um, and you understand that um, you can play with these scenarios in a healthy fictional environment to um, not um, be ethically problematic, not um, endanger real people. This is kind of axiomatically accepted as a uh, decent way to interact with these ideas. It could realistically just be an outrageous fantasy that isn't something John Norman like actually thinks should happen that uh, women should actually be slaves or uh, any kind of misogyny. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to tell because John Norman's kind of cagey about the subject. I mean, when he's interviewed on it, he acts kind of, um... What? No! In his 1974 book, Imaginative Sex, uh, he represents the idea of it just being a fantasy to spice things up in the bedroom. Okay, that's decent, healthy, but um, then when he's interviewed, he gets kind of sexist <laughs> and then goes back and forth about how much he means it. I'm not entirely sure how much I can take him at his word. How much is just fantasy? How much is an extrapolation of his beliefs? He's pretentiously obsessed with the idea that he penned this utopian society for true intellectuals. You know, Gore, the place with the slavery. But does that mean that he truly believes women should be enslaved? What? No! In 2011, when Gizmodo interviewed him, they asked him um, his thoughts on BDSM roleplay based on his Gorian scenarios and uh, lifestylers uh, playing out ideas based on uh, what, what he put down in his books. And he reacted in a very strange way. First reacting with all of the uh, self-righteous indignation of Count Dracula being asked if he wants an extra slice of garlic bread with his Italian food. I know nothing about real-life Gorian slavery among some people in the BDSM community. The BDSM reference worries me. I dissociate myself from BDSM, at least as I understand it. I may, of course, misunderstand it. I wonder if one would settle merely for real-life Gorian slavery, because as I understand it, BDSM is not Gorian. If something is not beautiful, it is not Gorian. That's right. Gorian is beautiful. If it is not beautiful, it is not of gore. That's totally not a red flag. He goes on to suggest what Gorian role players should do, which is kind of what they do do, consensual role play based on his Gorian scenarios. While distancing himself from S&M, which he's decided he's offended by today, despite Tarnsman of Gore totally leaning into it with sexy whips and flails, Tarl isn't into it, but that's because he's of Earth and not of Gore. So logically, it's of Gore and thus beautiful, right? If a woman chooses to submit herself voluntarily to a master, it seems to me that is her business and his business. She would then, of course, be a slave and would be treated as a slave. One supposes remarkable fulfillments may occur in such an arrangement. It is, of course, important to treat the slave however uncompromisingly strict you are with her, however much she may fear you in a humane way, as one would any other animal. Some men I gather dislike women and enjoy hurting them. That makes no sense to me. Women are wonderful and precious. It is a delight to own one. Why would one hurt her? 
The point is loving and serving and owning and mastering, not hurting. To be sure, the slave must understand that if she is not pleasing, she is subject to discipline. She is not to be left in doubt that she is a slave. It is easy to avoid discipline. She need only be obedient, submissive, and found pleasing wholly and in all ways. Wow, what a pleasant guy. Some of this could reasonably work within the context of a fantasy, uh, where there's an understanding of it as outrageous, but I don't get the sense that he's projecting a fantasy. He understands the context of talking about men owning women as slaves and starts rambling about that and gets into scary places. Also, Tarnsman of Gore totally promotes animal abuse with the Tarn Goad, Taming Tarns. In 2001, Worldcon, an international science fiction convention that had previously um, gotten uh, Norman to join them as, as a guest um, on four different occasions, decided to disinvite him from their 2001 convention in Philadelphia. And John Norman just totally lost it. Just He wrote this open letter and it's just batch it. <laughs> there's, there's no better way to describe it. They invited Norman, but he was being uh, annoying and increasingly at odds with modern society, modern politics, and they decided to disinvite him. And in response, he uh, penned this open letter that, oh my god, basically pseudo-intellectually challenged the decision to disinvite him with this unhinged rambling, um, let's see, um, calling himself a victim of discrimination by a desire to keep Worldcon politically correct, which, which at the time would have been strictly about feminism, um, claimed that selling a lot of books proves that he should be included, appealed to the idea that curating attendees based on politics as a threat to free speech, likened his exclusion to the Berlin Wall, accused his detractors of just hating sex, cited Ayn Rand as a crusader against prudishness that um, failed, unfortunately, referenced a proposed literary panel not being approved by the Worldcon organizers as some kind of death of intellectualism. It was about Poe and um, uh, Howard, the Conan the Barbarian guy, so I'm gonna suppose that there is some context that made it racist. Just speculating. And then just ended the letter with this hailstorm of insults, equating the people in charge of Worldcon with the French monarchy that um, the French Revolution overthrew and to the Soviets, uh, making a gratuitous reference to the gulags as the legacy of leftism, of course, and encouraged everyone to view his removal from Worldcon as a sign that American culture is abandoning freedom. So the gulags would be right around the corner if right-wing culture doesn't clamp down on political correctness right away you know, pushing hard against feminism, which says to me, guy actually wants to keep women as slaves. Okie dokie. Don't you like how Worldcon choosing for themselves who they want to have at their con uh, is some kind of death of freedom that must be corrected through some kind of top-down organizational force? Very libertarian of him. I'm just glad that this happened before cancel culture became a thing. Yeah, so he's a libertarian, but he's a hypocrite. <laughs> he's obviously a fan of Ayn Rand, um, who promoted this idea that authoritarianism from rightist and leftist factions are both the same kind of evil, and market forces should be the guiding forces of the world. So companies would profit based on what is beneficial, and thus the market forces, without a top-down organizational authoritative force, would um, uh, determine what um, uh, what is best, the, the invisible hand of the marketplace. 
She's also a bit of a hypocrite who saw colonialism as a good thing because indigenous people lacked the concept of property and if they couldn't um, hold capitalist notions themselves, then capitalists could impose imperialist force to take their stuff from them and assign it market value. So she ultimately uh, embraced a might makes right system um, based on her cultural biases. What John Norman is doing is uh, admiring Ayn Rand and not um, vetting her ideas. Ayn Rand also um, had some difficulty understanding that just because she was turned on by the idea of um, um, being dominated by strong, powerful men who uh, understand business um, d doesn't mean that that that's how it should work for, for every woman, every woman in uh, society. So we can see where Ayn Rand would have influenced um, John Norman to write um, uh, Gore with this uh, male domination thing and um, the, the idea that he proves his own value by selling a lot of books as he represents in the uh, open letter um, and, and the focus that Gore has on the slave market and estimating the value of people. Mintar being this celebrated figure for being the most successful merchant in all of Gore. Uh, the, the opposition of authoritarianism through um, Marlenis, who might be Hitler, and uh, hypocritically um, having the good guys embrace the might makes right thing. Using the coercive force to dominate women and other city-states. It's very Ayn Rand. The open letter represents some of the worst sides of uh, right-wing libertarianism. Uh, this idea that just making the choice to exclude people represents the end of freedom instead of being freedom. <laughs> idea that uh, his books sold well so that makes him valuable, but then when his books stop selling well, that's because feminism is evil and we must oppose feminism as opposed to, oh, my worth has failed, <laughs> which would be consistent with, with the belief that your worth is determined through uh, the invisible hand of the marketplace. He has to change with the times to be profitable, or he just has to admit that he's um, no longer going to be a good will-selling author in the modern world and do something else. <laughs> That's how a pro proper capitalism-loving libertarian would um, embrace the issue, and instead we have this culture war. Basically, he just threw a big tantrum as an entitled bigot. So, does John Norman think that women should be slaves? I don't know. Honestly, it doesn't really matter. He's a misogynist. We can tell he's a misogynist. Um, whether... Uh, he really thinks he that, that that women should be slaves. I mean, come on, um, slavery is hard to maintain. It's just not very practical. Um, but it doesn't really matter when you can take gender roles back to the 1600s. After a certain point, it just becomes quibbling over technicalities. The man is clearly a misogynist who believes he penned a perfect utopia. He ends the uh, interview with Gizmodo with a simple wish that people embrace the books of gore. When the Gorian galley came to port, she carried exotic goods and news from remote, surprising lands. Even if she is driven away, she might not be forgotten. She has been once in port and might be remembered. One likes to hear of other lands. They exist. That was horrible! Your book is horrible! You're horrible! You're an irredeemable monster! Of gore.